Okay, so um, at this time when um, museums and the archives are reaching capacity and the heritage sector in the UK and also throughout Europe are looking at ways of prioritising funds from archaeological excavation um, for retention and disposal, I think that it's important to consider those projects which are making the most out of the archive to produce new methods of analysis and also to enhance our understanding of the past. And as the Archaeological Science Manager at HES, um, I have a particular interest in those projects that are making use of um, science, that have a science focus, and utilise the material um, that is often the first to be considered for disposal. So I quite liked what you were talking about earlier. Um, so before giving a couple of examples of projects, um, I wanted to start off by giving a background of some of the strategies, procedures and legislation which guides how archaeological assemblages in Scotland are reported and how they're allocated to museums and then how they're used in research. I feel that if we were to reflect on the future and what we do, we really need to um, fully understand the current challenges in each of the countries. There's a lot of similarities, so it makes it a lot easier, but um, hopefully that'll help it. We can be more collaborative in, in overcoming these. So the first is Scotland's archaeology strategy. Um, it should be noted that this is a strategy for um, the whole of the archaeology sector in Scotland. It's not, it doesn't belong to Historic Environment Scotland. Um, Museums and archives form um, a big part of this and in its development we actually looked to the overarching um, Museum Gallery Scotland uh, research strategies and um, their, yeah, as well as, as, well as government ones. Um, the vision, so what we want from the strategy is a Scotland where archaeology is for everyone, that Scotland is a place to, that, where the study of the past offers opportunities for us now and in the future to discover, care for, protect and enjoy our rich and diverse heritage. What it does is it focuses on five key aims. So the first one is delivering archaeology, which aims to broaden and deepen the impact and public benefit of archaeology within and beyond Scotland. So it's putting Scotland into an international context. Aim two is enhancing understanding, which aims to increase knowledge and understanding and interpretation of the past. Um, and that's where our research frameworks sit. Aim three, which is an important one here, and I'm going to come back to it. This aims to ensure that the management of material evidence for the human past is cared for by society and managed sustainably for present and future generations. Um, this is how, and this is in this area, we are engaging with museums the most. Aim four, encouraging greater engagement, um, aims to enable and encourage engagement with our past through creative and collaborative working, active involvement, learning for all ages, and enhanced archaeological presentation. And aim five, which I'm also going to come back to very, very briefly, aims to ensure that people, so everybody, has the opportunity to acquire and use archaeological skills that they need or desire, and those skills provide the underpinning for innovation. Um, and the understanding, interrogation and learning and also funding of archaeology. Now, if you want any more, um, have a look at the strategy. There's lots of examples of projects, that, some of which are utilising archives and things like that. Okay, so just to come back very briefly to AM3, um, as I mentioned, the museums sector um, are quite key within this. And one of the main points made within the delivery plan, I put it all up there, but you can get it online, um, is to increase access to collections to allow for learning, research, creativity and also participation. Um, this one's been a bit slow to start but we just recently had a workshop which was led by the National Museum of Scotland in association with the Museum Gallery of Scotland, so big overarching bodies, um, where we identified a number of challenges in the future of museums including capacity, so that's storage staff, we have an increasing number of archaeology collections that are looked after by non-archaeology curators. Now that in itself isn't an issue, but what is an issue is if they don't have access to the right information to be able to make the most of their collections. Um, another thing, retention and disposal came up, and um, also our treasure process, which I'll explain in a minute. And um, you'll see that we're slightly behind <coughs> England from the first one. Um, so we're just gonna let England make all the huge mistakes that cost them lots of money, and then we won't make them. I'm only joking. Um, I think we've got very different systems, as you'll see, so um, we just have to do what we're doing individually, and um, we're actually learning huge amounts from all the work that's going on. And so innovation and skills. Um, this one touches upon archives with a particular focus on science. So science um, and innovation in science is one of the things that we're concentrating on for the next 10 years. 
And um, what this aim does is it focuses on collaboration between different parts of the sector in order to share information and form creative projects. And what it does is it emphasises the um, utilisation of archives for educational workshops and we've been running a lot of science workshops and we will continue to do that. Um, and also uh, prioritising unpublished assemblages when we're talking to students. So um, we have five science PhD students that we're currently funding um, and several of them are have access to, to older exhibitions and older archives where the struggle is where that information has been thrown out because somebody hasn't quite understood so um, I, a lot of what was said earlier really does, does ring true with me as well. So, um, Treasure Trove Scotland, um, it, this is a system in which excavated assemblages and chance finds are reported to um, and allocated to museums. Um, we, don't have, we, we're, we're, we don't have the Treasure Act in 1996 in Scotland, instead we have the, the uh, Scots Law really, and all finds in Scotland actually become property of the Crown. This law extends to all types of objects, so not just precious metals, um, and it can be anything like stone and pottery, as long as it's not modern. I didn't want to change the slide while you've taken a photo, sorry. Um, so, um, is the role of Treasure Trove to ensure that all these objects um, are protected for national benefit? And is the Treasure Trove unit who's responsible for the daily running of the system? Now our Treasure Trove unit is two people and they cover the whole of Scotland. So you can see why we're flagging up, looking at, um, we're looking at, at, at how, we, how we do that. So um, after the artifacts, um, they're reported to Treasure Trove. Um, it's the Scottish Finds Allocation Panel who meet. It comprises archaeologists, and artifact specialists and museum specialists. And they decide to which museum the, the, the assemblage will be allocated. Now museums are, asked in advance, are told in advance, accredited museums are told in advance and they can fit in for the material. However, and these are my big bugbears, there are several categories of material which are not included. Um, human remains. So in England, there's a reburial policy. We don't have one in Scotland. So um, <coughs> human remains um, are not routinely reburied after excavation. Because human remains can't be owned by anybody, um, it means that they can't be put through charge to process. Usually what happens is the finds, any finds associated with human remains will go through the treasure trove process and then they will, the human remains will go with the finds when the finds are allocated. Um, that causes us problems when we have human remains found in isolation. So we have a lot of big eroding coastlines in Scotland and um, if, if we have dig up a dead person um, and they've got no finds, then technically that person has no home. So we're having to deal with that. What we do have um, is the treatment of human remains policy, which is used as the guideline for that. And my bugbear, if anybody who knows me has to sit and listen to me rant about this, is um, environmental remains, um, also not covered by treasure trove. There is a massive increase in the last 10 years of the amounts of samples because people are a bit scared and they, they just kind of sampled everything. And so we have a huge number of unprocessed soil samples that are finding their way into um, into museum archives and unfortunately that tends to be the first thing that people tend to throw away they're just like why have i got a ton of soil in my store and they get thrown away and that's actually one of the issues for one one of the phds that i supervise um, is she doesn't have access to that material anymore because it's been thrown away um, there's no national best practice guidance for these at the moment um, i'm starting i'm starting that process of, of writing those so um, if anybody's got any ideas, I'm ha I would be all ears. So just to give you a couple of examples before I finish up. Um, Diet to the Dark Ages, PhD by the fantastic Ursula Cesare at the University of Aberdeen. I don't know if anybody heard her talk yesterday, but she's fab. Um, what she's doing is using human remains from archives and museums throughout Scotland to reconstruct diet in individuals from the late Iron Age through to the medieval period. Her main questions are looking at the differences between diet in urban and rural settlement during a time of significant urbanisation, so big changes going on in Scotland. To ensure that her study is truly representative, she's needed to access huge numbers of individuals um, all throughout Scotland, and um, as well as more recent excavations. If we had a reburial policy, she wouldn't have that material there, so that's something I, I always worry that we're just going to throw out all the soil samples and just rebury all the humans. <laughs> what I'm trying to show is that it's not, it's not as easy as that. 
And um, what she is doing is using methodologies that were not available and not even that refined even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and so access to that collection is key in order to make her study useful, representative, and, and also fairly innovative. And I've been a bit naughty because this is my project. <laughs> um, <laughs> I worked on this project uh, before I worked for HES, but it is another HES funded project. What it's doing is it's bringing to publication 1950s excavation of an Iron Age wheelhouse in the Western Isles um, when they were building a rocket range in the area. The site was excavated as part of one of the largest rescue excavations that went on in Scotland. And in about six weeks, they surveyed and excavated over 30 sites in, in, uh, throughout the US. Very little surviving archive, this is probably it. We have this photograph here, and that's when we realized we had more than one wheelhouse, which we didn't know we had. Um, but what you can see as well is that it's very complex. We have quite a lot of complex stratigraphy in there as well. And it was in this project that the survival of the soil samples from 1952 and the faunal remains, so the unworked animal bone, um, that was key in unlocking the stratigraphy of the for us. What we did was we knew when the finds were dug up, because they were very meticulous in writing this, and we also knew um, how they dug in their grid squares. So what we did is we created a Harris matrix of the finds and then dated through those um, as much as we can in order to create um, a, a stratigraphy. Um, because we knew when things were dated, we assumed that it must either be at the same level or the level above um, in our matrix, and we fed those into a Bayesian um, model and it worked. Surprisingly, we didn't expect it to. And what it showed us was the start and end of occupation, but also multiple phases, um, and what appears to now be quite a large Iron Age village, which is stuck under Mbekula Airport. Um, so why that's significant is that these types of structure are often published on their own in isolation. I have a single wheelhouse. And what we're now starting to do is to look at community, um, which is part of new kind of theoretical ways of interpreting. Um, and we actually don't have that many wheelhouses dated in Scotland either. There's fairly few. Kate MacDonald did a PhD a few years ago and had to give up with wheelhouses because we just don't have it. So even though it's 1952 and there wasn't a lot of information, we're getting a huge amount out of it now. We're working with the local people in Benbecula um, in order to link prehistoric community with um, with current community, and um, which is working really well. And if we didn't have those remains, if they'd been thrown out because of the date to 1952, we wouldn't do that. So just to um, opportunities and challenges. Um, I think there's quite a lot of opportunities. We're continually developing new methodologies for the way that we um, interpret results, how we analyze material. We also have um, new techniques happening all the time. Um, I was talking. I was in the sedimentary DNA session, and they were getting um, sedimentary DNA out of ten-year-old samples that had been stored at room temperature. So every day, so we yeah, we need to see things. Like every day, we're getting new things happening. Um, interpretation within new theoretical frameworks. If that had been published in 1952, we wouldn't have had that community aspect. We wouldn't have been discussing that with the local communities now. Um, so again, we need to take that into consideration. And we really are getting a much more enhanced understanding of our past. For the um, challenges, I think our, our biggest challenge is how we lose, how we prevent the loss of information. It's not simple. There's no one size will fit all for any of this. And I'm sure we will make mistakes as we go on that journey. Um, so what we need to do is just think about the projects that already exist and what they're doing and where new innovation is coming around, especially in archaeological science, because I think that's really important. Um, I mentioned best practice guidelines, but we're quite good in Scotland at being quite connected and trying to do the same thing. We have a single national strategy and we have a single, region, uh, a single um, framework for, for research and we're now doing individual ones for each of the regions. So um, I'm definitely it's going to be something to work on and promoting access. If people don't know they're there, how are they going to go and look at the stuff? So you, you mentioned earlier, Duncan, about having a time limit. Well, it won't work if nobody knows the stuff's there. So we really need to think about promoting access. AHES, we're really lucky because um, we actually have a national um, archive um, for paper and digital that doesn't tend to go with the fence. So and you can get it online, Canmore, if you want to have a look. It's spectacular um, and the good thing about that is um, 
I can help with that because it's part of the same organisation, so we can be quite connected in that. Um, just to let you know that I'm not just here spouting, we put our money where our mouth is. So this is our archaeology programme where we look at um, where we fund archaeological projects and everything that I've mentioned is everything that we're taking into consideration when we look at projects, um, especially archive projects especially looking at finds disposal and retention and how we deal with the archive itself. So every, I like, you mentioned um, see, seeing archiving as the end of the, of the project. And for us, that wasn't always the way that we thought. The publication was said to be the end. And now we've got um, archives floating around that we're now having to track down and get them out. We're now paid for one where somebody had, the excavator had died years and years and years ago. And so I think that that is another key thing, is making sure the end of the process is the archiving and we can't see it as any other. Um, I also need to look beyond the shiny golden treasure. Um, and I, I would go and look at like soil samples, but I don't think anybody else is. So um, I think we need to take into consideration <coughs> the eco when we have these conversations about retention and disposal. So thank you very much for putting up with my voice.